Amen. <laughs> right, thank you. <laughs> I don't need any introduction, okay, we can start, right? All right, so thank you guys, thank you for inviting me here. You already know my name, where I work. The topic is BGP, BGP stream. I try to condense some uh, reference information here, uh, also for those are who are more novices on the topic and things that you can go and check later. There are some uh, references to publications or keywords or tools that you can check and hopefully it will be useful for you. Um, so yeah, the way, the way the presentation is structured, indeed there is a very quick tour, very superficial tour on BGP, on which we will go pretty fast. Then I will mention some of the tools of the trade, tools uh, that can help you in uh, measurement and monitoring uh, BGP. And then we'll talk about BGP Stream. It's an open source platform that we've developing in Keda uh, for, a, for a, a while now. Uh, and it's been available for a while. Uh, before starting, though, I wanted all of you here because I wanted to ask you. First of all, I want to know how many are the PhD students here? Since this is a PhD school, can you raise your hand? OK, so the majority. Nice. And how many of you do research related to BGP? OK, so I see a cluster there. One end here, not much. One end here, not many there. How many of you think you will do research involving BGP? A bit more. OK, cool. So among those who raised the hands, can you quickly tell us what you have been doing, what you are doing? Can I start with you? Sure. Like uh, super quickly, but just give an idea of what's yeah. uh, the topic of research in BGP. Okay. Uh, so I've been looking at uh, BGP data from RotFuse and a bunch of other places uh, like uh, this and look at AS paths and trying to infer uh, what we can learn from uh, the AS path and in terms of where they're announcing prefixes from, where a particular log. I'll be louder. So I've been looking at uh, AS paths from the BGP reps that we have and uh, trying to understand uh, or even trying to predict in some cases where a particular route would go through based on uh, what AS relationship that particular AS has with its neighboring ASs from Keda's AS relationship data set, also prefixes that it has been announcing. Uh, and uh, try to wait for detours, for example, paths popping up, uh, some country and coming back. So that's what I've been looking at. Cool. So you already used a lot of keywords, and maybe who is not familiar <laughs> with BGP Sorry. doesn't. No, 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 it's normal. I mean, to talk about these things, you have to at least use some technical terms. So I hope that some of these terms will come out during the presentation. Anybody else? I know the group in Berlin, they do a lot of BGP sex stuff, right? Samir escaped just when it was time for <laughs> I, I literally planned to call him, and he, he went. But you guys also work with him. So I do, I look at BGP data and RPKI data and try to infer whether RPKI deployment, how far it's along. If you have to describe RPKI in one sentence, what would uh, you say? It's a framework to secure BGP from its vulnerabilities that are just built into the BGP. Using cryptography. Using cryptography, using certificates, and yeah. Nice. OK. All right. I don't know. I don't want to burn all the time, but I'm, I'm, I'll be here all the week. I'm happy to talk to you guys if I can be helpful in any way. Probably you can teach me a lot of stuff. Uh, anyway, I'll be around today and the, and the whole week, but let, let's get started. So I'm assuming though some basic terms are known because you are PhD students in networking, probably doing measurements. So I'm assuming we know what BGP is, what ASs are, and the AS numbers, and so on. Um, maybe I should look here too. Uh, yeah, BGP is a routing protocol, uh, each uh, ASS announces update messages, we're going to talk about this more, it's part vector routing protocol. Um, it's typically used by routers of different autonomous systems to exchange information about routes, but an autonomous system typically has more BGP routers, and to talk to each other, these routers also use BGP. In that case, we talk about IBGP versus eBGP. Uh, there are slight differences, but most of um, our the, of this talk is related to eBGP. Um, packet format, really, we are not going to the packet format. It's just to, as I said, I'm trying to put in the slide, I try to put in the slide some references. But anyway, it's a layer 4 protocol that sits on top of TCP. Basically, what happened is that BGP neighbors, that we call also peers, they establish this uh, uh, peering uh, through a manual configuration between two routers. They create a BGP session that sits on top of a TCP session. BGP session is supposed to stay up basically 
all the time. So if there are no update messages exchanged, there are actually keep alive messages that are configured with different uh, times uh, in routers. These are those that are indicating the RFCs. The Cisco routers use slightly different timings. And uh, if the router doesn't hear from the other one within uh, a whole time, a holding time, it basically shuts down the connection and all the messages, all, all the routes that have been exchanged in that session basically are dropped, okay? Uh, these are some of the messages that are exchanged in BGP. Am I going too fast on this stuff? I think all of you know these things, right? So I, I, I'm trying to go quickly. Uh, we are mostly interested in update messages which are used for advertisement and withdrawals. When the session is started, basically the routers exchange all the routes that they know with a set of update messages and then they talk they only when there are changes in the routes that they know and that they want to advertise. So an advertisement uh, will contain an AS path. Um, yeah, this is a small <laughs> reference about eBGP. Uh, in iBGP, uh, the AS doesn't add its uh, AS number because it talks to the other a um, the router, doesn't add its AS number because it talks to the other routers of the same AS. So, but normally, instead, when an AS announces a route to another uh, autonomous system, it adds its own AS number. This is a convention with which we write uh, AS paths, typically, so the, prefi the prefix is all the way on the right, and then each AS that propagates a route message prepends its uh, AS number on the left side, okay? Withdrawals are uh, only used for, uh, uh, sorry, withdrawals only carry the prefix information, we com which complicates life, especially when you're doing measurements and monitoring, because if you're trying to infer certain information, you need to keep state. Uh, the AS path is, is used in BGP also for a loop avoidance mechanism. When a router receives a route, it checks that that path doesn't contain its own AS number. If it contains its own AS number, it will drop that route. It will not consider it to avoid a loop. Does it make sense? Okay. So this is a slide instead where I, I want you to pay attention. Probably lots of you know about this stuff. It may sound a bit boring, but there are references to these things. And actually, when you understand this concept, everything becomes easier related to BGP. A lot of stuff becomes easier. And the terms are really not very friendly, but these are those that are in the RFCs. So how does a BGP router maintain this reachability information? It uses what is called the routing information base, which is really a set of sets, uh, at least from a theoretical point of view, because then the implementation is, is different in the routers. It's like a big table with multiple entry points. But from a theoretical point of view, and the way it's discussed in the, in the RFC, in the standard, is this one. There are these uh, adjacent, that I always want to call it that, adjacent. <laughs> Uh, routing information bases in, in input, there is one of these tables, theoretically, for each single peer of the router, okay? So for each uh, router with, with which, for, e for each AS, with which a router has a peering session, uh, the inbound messages are saved in the, the adjacent ribs in, and some of them can be filtered based on some ingress uh, filtering rules, and then this information is collected and only um, some of these routes from the adj uh, adjacent ribs in are saved in the local rib. Okay. And basically there is a process, which is the BGP decision process, that is based on some local preferences that will make the router pick for each single prefix only a single route. You know th this stuff. It's more to get used to the terminology, right? So you have this uh, uh, local rib, and the local rib is used basically for, by the router to uh, choose the best paths, right? It saves the information about the best paths, and then they are installed and they're used for the forwarding <coughs> table, so to forward the actual packets, the actual traffic. And then this information will be propagated to the other routers. And the way it's propagated is that this information is copied, but with some filters, to uh, the adjacent ribs out. And again, here, there is one for each router with which the, the router that we are considering is peering. And again, here, there are some filters that are applied. So not all the rules, or not all the routes, sorry, that are in the local rib are actually uh, COVID in each single adjacent ribs route. And it depends on policies. And now we're going to mention this. Does this make sense to you? Again, am I going too fast? No. Yeah. This is stuff you're familiar with, all of you. Not everybody. Guys, move your heads, shake your heads, right? Yes or no? You're good. Okay. 
relationships. So uh, a, a bunch of definitions. So a transit AS is an AS that carries traffic on behalf of another autonomous system and it does it. No, sorry, that's it. That's the definition of transit. A stub AS is the opposite of a transit AS. Um, there are economic relationships between AS. So a transit AS for an autonomous system that does it for a, a, a monetary uh, income uh, providing a service is basically a provider, so it's called the provider, and the relationship between these two AS is called uh, provider to customer or customer to provider. Instead, there may be an autonomous system that decides uh, to exchange traffic for themselves and their users with no monetary exchange, just for the reciprocal advantage. In this case, we talk about peer to peer relationship, and these are uh, peering relationships, these are relationships, economic relationships between autonomous systems that are connected to each other. Does it make sense? Then there is this special type of relation, sibling to sibling, which really, we just talk about siblings uh, commonly in our work. It's autonomous systems that basically belong to the same administration, to the same organization. So we, it happens, especially for the big providers, that they may have uh, multiple autonomous system numbers. This happens also because of acquisitions of companies, of telecom companies, and then multiple autonomous system numbers are, uh, are preserved, but they are all owned by the same organization. And this is something that you typically want to know, because what happens in practice is that uh, in the real deployments there is a lot of confusion. So prefix is that normally you consider belonging to a certain autonomous system number, and they are registered maybe on the UIS database, and other databases as related to that autonomous system number are used by another autonomous system number simply because they are in the same organization in reality. Does it make sense? <coughs> okay. Um, these relationships uh, influence the preferences that we've been talking about very briefly, the import and the export policies that I was saying. Imagine that, for example, typically an autonomous system will prefer a customer over a provider. When I say we prefer a customer over a provider, I refer to, I, I mean, when there, is, when there are multiple routes towards the same prefix, so to reach the same destination, but coming from different AS, right? Imagine you are peering, you have a, a BGP session with your customer and with your provider. If you have to choose from which of the two you have to take a route, you will take a route from your customer because you are not paying for the traffic that goes to your customer. If you send your traffic to reach that destination to your provider, you're gonna pay. So why doing that? So for example, this is something that is gonna influence how the information from the JSON trip in um, sorry, this is going to influence how you build the local rib, right? So when you build the local rib, you will take information from all your adjacent ribs in, and then you will make decisions based on your, on your local pref, on your local preferences. And here, for example, for multiple routes, as I said, towards the same prefix, you will prefer routes towards your neighbor, towards your neighbors, compared to routes towards your, uh, sorry, towards your customers compared to routes towards your providers. Does it make sense? Yep, okay. Um, relationships, uh, simple relationships have been uh, uh, modeled by the famous Gaur export model. It's difficult to not find this term in any paper that does BGP stuff, basically. Even if it's an old model and it's quite simplistic and it's been attacked and criticized and prepared to see it criticized uh, uh, continuously, it's still a model that it's used a lot, especially in simulations. First of all, because we don't have anything better, uh, and because some of the principles are, are valid, and actually most of the time they are applied. And the basic three principles that you can, uh, that you see fine in the Gaur export model is that an autonomous system does not transit uh, traffic at a revenue loss, okay? Which is, a, is a, a also called the value-free assumption. So in this case, for example, we have this autonomous system Sorry, here they're called V1AX. Don't ask me why we use the number. I just stole a, 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 a diagram from an NSF proposal that uh, actually got funded, even if we use uh, inconsistent <laughs> labels for the, for the graphs. Uh, the point here is that ASV announces a prefix. And here, we didn't even respect the conventions that I told you about. about. So this, this, this diagram, <laughs> you should forget about it. But just take, take this, this piece of information. ASV announces. Okay, advertises a prefix on by V, okay? And then it announces to AS1. And then AS1 adds itself, so we have V1 and propagates it to ASA. At this point, ASA 
should not propagate this route to ASX. Otherwise, it will create a valley. You see the valley, and there is a, the violation of this valley free assumption. Why shouldn't we do it? Can somebody answer so that I drink water? You are bad. Ah, you are answering. No, they're not a transit provider, so. Right, you are not, ASA is not a transit provider for ASX. Why would it accept to carry, all, to carry the traffic that from <laughs> ASX wants to reach ASP, right? The traffic would travel this way, and the ASA is not making any money out of this, right? So the concept of the revenue. Now, since this slide is called relationships, I couldn't resist, and I wanted to call the next slide, it's complicated. Uh, and then I use terms like, okay, complex relationships, conflicts, and lies, and there are some references here. Um, the point is that the story on BGP, I'm trying to wrap up this super quick tour about BGP, but it, the, the story is a bit more complicated, starting from the, the relationships. So in reality, there are more complex relationships uh, that they are not captured by the simplistic model of the Gaur export model. We know about it. About it. There are stud studies that try to infer more complex relationship studies that are proposing definitions of more complex relationships. One of the reasons is that because uh, operators may have different behaviors related to different prefixes. They have more uh, fine-grained policies about how they behave about carrying certain traffic from certain operators. Another thing that complicates the whole story is that certain autonomous systems are so big that they have a presence worldwide in many different places. And in different places, they peer with other ASs. And sometimes they peer with the same ASs in different places worldwide, and they have different policies based on where they are. If they are an IXP in Tokyo versus an IXP in the US, right? So this <laughs> makes these relationships complicated. Um, other concepts that I, we will touch some of these, uh, mention some of these things, or you will do some exercise in the lab. I haven't introduced Alistair, by the way. He's sitting there, he can raise your hand. Uh, who's gonna lead, basically, the, the lab on BGP stream. So you will see some of these things. The concept of multi-origin AS conflicts. It happens when the same prefix is originated by multiple uh, autonomous systems. This can happen for benign reasons. And there are here a couple of reference studies. And I managed to squeeze in also reference to a TMA paper. Um, that study the phenomenon of uh, MOAS conflicts, multiple origin ASs. One of, the reasons, uh, one of the benign reasons why it may happen is just because of uh, Anycast. So you know how Anycast work. I'm assuming you know about that. Um, and uh, the announcement of the same prefix happen, happens in two different ASs. This is not common, but, but it happens. Another case where it can happen instead is here, lies. Like some, B, some BGP routers, since there is no authentication, and that's why Samir, you were escaping <laughs> before. We were looking for people working on BGPSEC. That's why you guys are working, for example, on BGPSEC, to try to authenticate uh, announcements, right? Because advertisements are not validated. And so autonomous systems can lie about owning a prefix, about seeing a certain path, and so on. So this is something that happens a lot and complicates your analysis. You may do research on BGP hijacking, but you may even want to do research just about statistics on BGP. And then, since BGP hijacking actually happens, that will pollute your results. So things start to get tricky, and that's why they're interesting, probably. AS sets is another concept. So in the AS path, sometimes AS numbers can be aggregated in un unnumbered sets. And it may happen, again, for different reasons. The main one is, is aggregation. But you can use this, uh, actually, this feature as, uh, uh, within some measurement techniques. I, I may briefly mention them, or we can talk about them offline. I don't know if you are, have heard about BGP poisoning. Anybody, has anybody read the paper Lifeguard in Sitcom? Quarut? Nobody? OK, if you are curious, talk to me. There are some interesting techniques for measurements on BGP that uh, take advantage of AS sets. Uh, path prepending is a technique in which uh, an autonomous system, instead of uh, prepending its AS number once, it does it multiple times. What could be a reason to do that? So, when, so that you tell that I have the route, but avoid this. It's not preferred. You the have the route, but? So the AS path length would be longer. So when the decision, the PGP decision process comes along, it will look like this is a longer route. I should not prefer it. Right, so imagine you announce um, your prefix, and you announce that you have maybe two providers, right? And you have a strong preference for one of the two providers. 
but you want to use the other provider as a, as a backup link. So you will announce your prefix normally to the provider for which you have preference, and then instead you will uh, prepend your AS number multiple times, three, four, five times, to the, the prefix, to the AS path that you announce to the provider for which you have less preference. So what will happen is when this path travels uh, around, it will not be picked, right? It will be, it, the second one will not be preferred. Right? The first one will be preferred over the second one because it's a shorter path. I didn't mention the shortest path um, concept because I'm giving it for granted. Uh, BGP communities are um, a way, and you will see or will mention BGP communities uh, actually probably even during this talk if I manage to squeeze in everything. Uh, but I think we will see them in the, in the exercises too. Right. Yeah. <coughs> so these are special attributes that are actually heavily used uh, in uh, real deployments. And there are attributes that are used to exchange information, propagate information, not just to your peers, but also to, so not just to your neighbors, but to other AESs that are far from you. They are used, for example, they can indicate some geolocation information. Uh, they are used to, um, for example, in the context of denial of service mitigation attacks, there are uh, communities attributes that are used to indicate to your providers or to your neighbors to filter a determined prefix and black hole it so that this uh, traffic doesn't get to you because it's being flooded by the denial of service attack. So uh, in, uh, if you're interested in BGP measurements, this is something you should definitely keep an eye on. Like this, <coughs> this topic has been more active in the last few years. Uh, I guess I can skip the last point. Uh, it's just that BGP supports multiple address families, not just uh, uh, Unigast uh, v4 and v6. It's used also in other, um, in other ways. So this was the quick tour, 20 minutes, more or less, on, on BGP. So next question is, okay, why do we care? I normally put it at the beginning, but since uh, here we are, uh, I feel that I'm preaching to the choir, I didn't give much relevance to these, these slides. These are slides that I've more or less, uh, yeah, almost uh, verbatim um, reused from uh, a presentation to the IPF. Right? So there maybe you need to m explain to certain engineers that measurements are important. Measurements and monitoring are important in product, are important for uh, designing protocol evolution. But of course, why do we care about BGP? It's the central nervous system of the internet. It's what makes the internet actually happen and communicate, right? However, the problem is that design of this protocol, which is like 40 years old, has some flaws that affect availability, performance, security, like uh, delay convergence, route oscillations, uh, but inflation, uh, prefix uh, hijacking that I was mentioning earlier, and so on. Um, I don't know if here there is the bigger line. Oh, that's fine. Okay. So the question is, okay, we, we need to better understand the BGP ecosystem, though, to, to better design the new protocols or to better understand what are these issues? And the problem is that we know very little about the structures and the dynamics of this system, even if it's so relevant for us and for the internet. Indeed, most of our knowledge is based, uh, which, which is also good for us, because we do measurements, right? So it means there is a job for you guys. Uh, but really, a lot of our knowledge is based on inference and on inference on incomplete data. Indeed, we infer AS-level topologies and, uh, that are incomplete, right? We infer AS relationships, and it's quite complex to do it. Sometimes, as I said, it's complex even to define them. And it's even more difficult to infer what are the policies that really are deployed and which impact they can, can have when the network conditions change. And this can actually affect even the security of BGPSEC, has been demonstrated recently. This is a, a, a pretty interesting paper that if you're interested in BGPSEC, BGP security, and RPDI, you should check. Um, so as I said, I'm not spending much time here um, because I think I don't need to convince you about that, do I? Okay. So uh, phase two of the presentation. Here I try to, to put references to a bunch of tools, systems, approaches that are useful for your job if you do BGP measurements and monitoring and analysis. And I try to sketch the landscape forcing things a little bit, but more or less in these categories, right? There is the real data generation that comes from the real deployments from the routers, and uh, the data collection, the possibility to inject data actually in the system, and then the processing and analysis. And um, 
yes, starting from the data generation, we are lucky because BGP is a pretty transparent protocol. It's a protocol that shares information, right? So it's almost like a measurement protocol. It's giving you data naturally. Um, however, there, is been, uh, there have been attempts in the past, uh, and also recently, I think Emil Abben there, the guy who was yelling and, uh, at, and tomorrow we'll have uh, his own lecture, uh, also is responsible for this uh, draft, right, for this ITF draft, which is about um, augmenting the amount of information that routers uh, produce, generate, specifically to help us in measurements and in monitoring. So it's specifically about generating communities attributes that give an idea about the route collection process and from where the routes are learned. You can say. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's about um, three simple classes. Is this an internal route? Is this a peer route? Or is this uh, any other route? Uh, but currently it's dead in the water. Nobody's interested. So um, there's an ITF coming up in Prague. So maybe you will do another. And that, that's, that's another way that researchers I don't know, I, I wouldn't say that nobody, I mean, you are interested, other people are interested in it, it's just that also the ITF is difficult to, I think, to bring something yeah. to the, I see, here I see a lot of people nodding, I saw some people nodding about that, but it, because there has been an attempt also in the past with an RFC to, to try to specify some communities for And that part. one's really, really, really complex, so it finds like all the, all the different colors of, of these three prefixes, and the other one is, is the other side. The one that you have proposed yeah. recently to make to try to make adoption, yeah, similar. Well, well, right. Don't work, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, another aspect related to uh, data generation is that you may not want to get data from the nor not be able to get data from the real routers. You can create your own test beds. You can create your own test beds even with virtual machines. And the idea in this case then is to use open source software routers. And there is a. Uh, there are quite some tools that are pretty popular. Quagga is probably the oldest one. Some people, maybe the older ones, may remember Zebra. Quagga is a, is a, a, a more recent version, like a spin-off of Zebra that then became more popular. Bird and GoBGP is really the, one of the newest ones that is written in the Go language. Um, you may be familiar with them. Um, some of them are actually used also operationally to implement route servers and uh, route reflectors. Route servers are typically deployed uh, in uh, IXPs, Internet Exchange Points. Uh, there is an entire RFC about route servers. You may encounter them, and they may be your friends in your uh, research on BGP measurements, so you may want to know a little bit more about them. But typically, they are used as a broker system within an IXP where there are multiple ASs. Imagine hundreds of ASs that are uh, peering in the same site, and they are sharing the same layer too. But then, if they want to create uh, peering sessions, they have to create, imagine they would need to create a full mesh, for example, if they all want to peer to each other. And instead of having this full mesh, it's more practical, practical um, to, well, to introduce a single point of failure with a broker, but this uh, can also be mitigated, um, which is actually a route server. So the route server we lacked as a router, uh, will not, as an AS, a BGP router, will not add an autonomous system number, typically and will not, the differences will not forward traffic. It will just, as I said, do brokerage of the routes. Um, and this, I think it's written here, right? Uh, route reflectors, I don't have a slide about them, but basically they are very similar concept, but there is instead used <coughs> within the same autonomous system. As we said, in the same autonomous system, you have multiple BGP routers, they need to talk to each other. You may have a route reflector inside of your autonomous system to exchange information in a more a flexible way, a more efficient way between them. Now, let's move to more, um, I don't know, to me, more interesting stuff. Uh, the data collection part. So we, we have some tools here of the trade. Some of them are more recent, some are more traditional, and they have been revised. And uh, the famous ones are the route collectors. So um, what are looking glasses? Um, who knows what looking glasses are? So I get I see one hand there, one hand there, one here. Emil, really? <laughs> okay, not many. Okay, looking glasses are basically interfaces 
to real routers deployed on the internet or to route servers. And that can be pretty useful because then you can get all the data that uh, a central point and an IXP sees from a lot of peers at once. And they can be uh, ask interfaces like uh, telnet that you can reach them through, through the telnet command or, uh, or most commonly they have a web interface. So they're a simple web app that acts as an interface towards a, an operational router. And of course the operators will not let you mess with the router so you will get read-only access and uh, access to a subset of commands but they will allow you to check their routing tables m most of the time. For example, uh, you can use, this information is typically used by operators for troubleshooting purposes because then you can go and check in someone else's router how they see a path towards your prefixes, how they reach you or if they don't reach you, right? Uh, however, this is a quite useful tool for measurements because um, First of all, there are plenty of them around, more than uh, 2,000, like the order of 1,000 around. Um, also, um, several of these looking glasses allow you to execute trace routes and pins. So to do measurements on the data plane by also acquiring information on the control plane, the BGP data, from the same vantage point, which is kind of the dream of our job, right? So having one vantage point from which you can see both control plane, if somebody may <laughs> Uh, may disagree about that. Uh, seeing both uh, data plane and control plane information, right, and being able to correlate them, and that can, can tell you a lot. Um, as I said, they are traditionally more useful for interactive exploration, troubleshooting of data, okay, rather than systematic and continuous data acquisition. However, Keira, the group that I work uh, with, but uh, I, I didn't participate in this work, created a, an abstraction layer that is called Periscope, that uh, exposes a unified API to talk to looking glasses all over the world. What I didn't say is that these looking glasses are very heterogeneous in terms of interfaces, APIs, and so the output that they generate. And uh, typically there is not, a, a, I mean not typically, there is not a single place where they are all listed. So you have to go and harvest them from multiple lists or scan, look for them. Uh, instead, Periscope provides a single place where you can use one API to talk in a systematic way to multiple looking glasses and maintain even a persistent uh, virtual connection with them. And so that you can organize um, complex experiments by leveraging the pervasiveness, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, of this infrastructure. Right. So this is something pretty new. And so this is the kind of stuff that I try to cram to put in these slides. Um, um, so this is a quite powerful tool. It has some pros and cons, and still, uh, I mean, the access I is uh, limited based on uh, uh, requests to access the system, because still the system <coughs> is delicate, it can be abused. Uh, so there is, a type, there is a pump paper about this system. You can read more about that, and you can contact us and tell us what's the experiment you want to run, and uh, uh, we provide a system, sort of system with credit so that you can use this for your experience. So there have been papers published at IMC, at, uh, I don't remember if it's SQL too, but anyway, uh, in the conferences that we typically target, there have been recently papers using this infrastructure, not, in which we are not included. Like we just provide infrastructure for other researchers to do their work. Can you run trace routes? With Sorry? Can you run trace routes with Periscope? You can do trace routes. I don't think that feature is enabled by default. Okay. But yes, you can. So the, the, the infrastructure is designed to allow you to do trace routes. And that's at least for me, for the type of research that I do, that's the most appealing feature because then I will be able to do both trace routes and See check the control plane. plane. Just to give you a, a, a concrete example of why I may care, for example, a big problem um, in, uh, in our field of research, at least in my area, is trying to translate AS, uh, sorry, trace routes, so the results of trace routes into AS paths, like theoretically, into which AS <laughs> And I see him laughing and <laughs> shaking his head because it's, uh, I mean, it's a long-standing problem, would you say in English? <laughs> uh, it's really, really hard. And it's hard also because there is no ground truth. And really, the ground truth doesn't exist in that case because what the router tells you on its routing table doesn't necessarily mean that it's really the hops that are going to be traversed, right? That's just information saved in the routing table. But anyway, I don't want to yeah. diverge on this. But the point is that normally it's very hard to have ground truth about what a trace route, uh, what AS paths a trace route will follow. When you access information from a looking glass, you have the opportunity to see both types of information, right? 
You can execute a trace route at a certain point in time from a looking glass, while at the same time you read its routing table towards the same destination prefix. So you can see what's the AS path that the router is supposed, well, not the router, that the packets are supposed to follow if everything remains consistent and nobody has lied along the path, right? So you need some ifs there, and there is no balancing on anything. Um, at the same time, you execute the trace route, right? And so you have the hopes in, at, uh, in terms of IP addresses that have been followed. And then you can compare them. So that's quite useful. I hope I, I solve this thing. Um, OK, this is something that we really care about because BGP stream is based on them, on uh, route collectors. So we need to go uh, through it. Well, the concept is pretty simple. Basically, a route collector is, is typically a fake router, a software router, like uh, Quagga, the software routers that I, that I showed you, that establishes a, a peering session with a really deployed router, just in order not to really exchange traffic, but just to uh, receive um, advertisements, updates. And so basically to capture an image of, ideally, of its uh, lock, where is it, the lock rib, okay, the local uh, routing information base. So um, this basically happens on a voluntary basis. Uh, there are kindly uh, autonomous systems that allow organizations like RIPE, uh, Route Views, uh, Packet Cleaning House, uh, BGP Mon from Colorado State that they are coming from. Uh, that allow them to, to peer with them, to establish these fake peering sessions that really don't exchange traffic, and to acquire information from their routers. And the operators did it and started doing it 20 years ago because they have interest in getting this data because it's useful for troubleshooting problems. It's actually pretty useful to them. It, I think the same phenomenon came together with the phenomenon of the looking glasses, right? I mean, prob probably, <laughs> OK. Um, I hope we're not recorded or we're just streamed. Uh, okay. Um, let's see what else is important. So each by ah, sorry, we tend to call these real, really deployed operational routers. We tend to call them uh, vantage points, monitors. Sometimes we call them peer because they peer with the route collectors, the software routers that are administered by RIPE or RouteViews. Okay, but typically I prefer to avoid the term peer and to use monitor and DPs. I don't promise that I. I'm always consistent on that. So each vantage point, each of them sends to the collector update messages. Each time, the adjacency rib out changes, right? And why would the adjacency rib out change? It changes because the lock rib changes. Remember, you the router just tries to copy the lock rib and to send it to the the neighbors, but it applies. It may apply a filter, and I'll get back to it uh, later. So what the what the collector does is for each vantage point, it maintains a session state with some state messages in the case of write this, right? Um, and an image of the adjacency rebound table, right? It, it tries to reproduce the adjacency rebound table because the vantage point is just sending, the vantage point is just sending update messages over time. When something changes, it, right? But the, the collector is maintaining an image consistent with the update messages that it received. And it also saves these update messages. And then what it does, it regularly produces dumps that we typically, we typically, that we call rib dumps and update dumps. And uh, the rib dumps are really dumps of this uh, snapshot of the adjacency rib out that we have inferred, that we have reconstructed, right, of the vantage point. And they are typically uh, released every few hours. I think it's, uh, it's two hours uh, and eight hours for Routfuse and Vipris, and I confuse always. Routfuse is two. Route views is two, and write views is every eight hours. So this information is pretty useful. If you just need a snapshot of, of what's the routing table, how it looks like at certain vantage point, and that's all you need, and you don't need much information with uh, fine granularity in time. Right, eight hours, two hours. It's the information that is used for ripe stuff that I will mention also later. But if instead you want to know more about the dynamics of BGP and what happens, then you need to know about all the updates that have been uh, generated. So all the changes that have been um, that affected the adjacency rebound because of the changes in the lock rib, right? So what you are seeing through the route collector is basically the preferred path that the vantage point has chosen at a certain point in time. So if you want fine grained information, you will use the update dumps. The update messages are generated every 15 minutes and 5 minutes. 
15 minutes for rough use. 15 minutes for rough use, 5 minutes for right this. Yeah. Uh, the dumps are generated every 5 minutes, right? But they contain information with timestamps about all the updates that in those 5 minutes time intervals have been generated, right? So you actually have um, a quite good, um, how do you say, information about the, the dynamics, the changes in the, in the routes, in the preferred routes. So I already mentioned some of these projects. Um, they are pretty useful because they have hundreds of monitors. And it has been shown that they're actually complementary in the coverage. So as a, as a measurement researcher, you probably want to get as much as you can and try to use all this information. Depends on the, the study that you need to do. Uh, but they have a pretty good coverage of the internet topology. But we're talking about, what, 60,000 ASs versus a few hundreds of monitors. But they are placed worldwide, and they give you um, pretty useful information. Uh, I talked about dumps. And these dumps are archived in files, typically in a format that is called MRT. I will get back to it later. Um, and they are accessed through an archive, uh, archives through HTTP or FTP. But slowly, and this is important for you, because um, you are younger, so you are luckier, because the newer generation of these collectors are starting to uh, stream their data. Instead of generating dumps at the interval of five minutes and uh, two hours and eight hours and so on, that gave us a lot of headaches, now they're finally starting to stream them. And lots of kudos arrived because they, they started this process. And they have some of their monitors already streaming live. And they stream in a different format rather than MRT. In the, in a JSON format that it's easier to buy. So things are evolving slowly. Um, BGPMON is doing the same, actually. The BGPMON project from Colorado State University is uh, streaming live data from multiple monitors. And some of them actually overlap with the monitors of, uh, are the actual yeah, monitors of route use. So yeah, that's uh, when you say streaming with BGPMON. Uh, so we basically mirror all the data from route use. But route use data arrives mm -hmm. in batches. So when you say streaming from BGPMON, you basically rely on that time interval. So there is a lag in between. Yeah, but there are newer uh, peers that peer directly with PGP on, and then with that you can get as soon as you get into the PGP on daemon, as soon as you get it. So that's like a difference between streaming uh, if the peer is an Arcus peer or a direct PGP on peer. Just something to know. No, this is good. I, I think this is an interesting area for us that we do measurements because it's really evolving right now. I mean, the, these people are meeting, we are working together, we are collaborating, we are creating hackathons to try to design better collections and measurement systems and uh, platforms that all of us can use to uh, do better measurements and acquire more data. So it's, uh, there is a lot of work in progress. There are lots of caveats and different formats. It's, uh, I mean, I suggest you to keep an eye on this. Uh, there is an important concept that sometimes it's, uh, is not um, captured. Uh, uh, the one of full feed versus partial feed uh, vantage points. So in a normal case, uh, a vantage point would treat the collector as a customer. So that means, based on the revenue uh, principle, right, that it has interest in sharing all its routes. Right? Because it wants the customer to use its link, because it's paid for it. So that means that basically it will propagate in the adjacency rib out or towards that peer, towards the collector, the entire content of the local rib, which is really what we want. I mean, theoretically, we want everything, right? Like, as measurement people, we want to know everything that the router sees. But I mean, <laughs> anyway, this is a long story. But at least this way, we get knowledge of what, what are the, the best paths, the preferred paths that that router has chosen to this inference of the local read. However, this doesn't always happen. And this is because, as I said, all these projects are on a volunteer basis. And the reasons why they have been deployed over time are multiple. Sometimes these uh, setups, especially with this, I think, have been deployed for other reasons, like the beacons. Right, the reason why there are partial feed is big. It's also because system administrators change, I think. There are a lot of caveats in the real world deployment. So what happens is basically that some routers are not sharing their entire routing table. Right? So sometimes they are sharing only routes towards their own prefixes and not their customer prefixes, and so on. Yeah? It may be interesting uh, that there is work on the way also in, uh, I think it's an IDF now, where in 
the initial exchange, you'd say this is this type of feed is really useful. That would be amazing. Yes, people are discussing this. Ah, so thank God. That, that, that's also like a whole lot of research follows on currents there. Uh, this is the second time that Emil brings up the topic of the ITF. Well, the first time maybe I did it, but through you, basically. Right? Uh, yeah, this is another interesting thing. I mean, lots of us should try to participate in these uh, activities because there is need for measurement folks to say a word in, uh, in this context, right? Because we can help uh, each other, basically. Um, <laughs> this is an important point because so the definition of full feed, it's easy, right? It's OK, if it shares everything of its local rib, it's a full feed. But how do you know if it's a full feed or if it's not? If it's not? You don't know how many routes are supposed to be in the log rib. Right? So when you do a measurement, how do you figure it out? So in reality, what we had to do for our measurements, we just had a meal as a blog post about this. Uh, but also in the BGV stream paper, you find our own definition, which is totally arbitrary. We just fixed the threshold. So we looked at all the routing table sizes that we could get from route views and ripers, and we were see where the knee of the curve was. And we said, OK, we're going to cut here. And if there are more than 400,000 routes in the routing table, we decide it's a full feed peer. It's not very rigorous, right? So the feature Emil was talking about, that the router would uh, advertise the information if it's sharing or not, the entire routing table is actually pretty useful, right? OK. Uh, this, is, this is something that, I mean, I wanted to put it here because it took me a while to grasp this concept and then to make it operational, and, and I see him not being as well. I mean, it's, uh, uh, these are all, I mean, it's not rocket science, but it's all stuff that you have to deal with, and you, you know it, right? When you do measurements, you have to deal with multiple layers of complexities. Um, now, talking about even more modern approaches, because uh, you, you have noticed that the, the route collector approach is uh, kind of a hack. Right. You are creating a software router, establishing a peering session. In reality, you are not going to exchange traffic with that router. And then you, you try to collect this information. And you, it means you have to convince an operator, a network administrator, to establish a BGP peering session with them. It's not always easy. It, 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 it's, it, it's not a mechanism that has been designed. As I said, it's a hack. Instead, uh, the ITF and the, uh, um, the vendors have uh, started a while ago to standardize, uh, finally, a BGP monitoring <laughs> protocol. It took them a while. It's been dropped for, uh, for quite a long time. And I, I don't remember if it was this year or at the end of last year, it became an RFC. The funny thing is that this protocol has been supported by Juniper, Cisco, and other vendors already for years. So current routers already support this protocol. What does it mean that they support this protocol is that <coughs> basically you can add a, a a configuration line to the router and establish that the router will start streaming uh, uh, information for all of its peers or some of its peers, and you can configure even some filters towards a collector, a BMP collector. Okay. Any questions? I see, guys, you are starting to get tired. Um, <coughs> anyway, as I said, it's a system design on purpose to do this. Uh, it's encapsulation of the BGP messages, so BMP sits here. Right? Uh, it's a pretty elementary process. Uh, it's highly efficient. It's designed to, to keep um, minimum uh, memory and CPU usage on the router. So this way, uh, operators will be happier. That means that if you're doing measurements and if you know operators, you, can, you have much more chances to convince them to actually share data with you. Right? Because you can set up a BMP collector, and you can get your own data. And you can get data from the operators that you really care about, which may not be covered by route views and write views, and you get it in real time. Or maybe you can even convince them to share the data with the collector that you make public. And that's what we are actually trying to do with BGP stream. So, uh, and the reason why you can do that, that you can you use set up your own collector, is because there is an open source project. It's actually sponsored by Cisco. It's, it's carried out mostly by Cisco employees, which is called OpenBMP. And they, they also, now they've been endorsed by the Linux Foundation, and they call themselves also SNES, which I, I, don't, I don't remember what the acronym, the acronym stands for. Uh, but it's basically an open source implementation of BMP uh, to store and maintain data both in real time and historically. And it basically saves data into an, uh, an Apache Kafka bus. Uh, so at the end, the data is stored in a Kafka bus with, how many of you have used Kafka for your work? No, no. 
One, two, three, not many. But it's a pretty cool tool, especially for uh, big and live data, right? It's a sort of a distributed bus. I don't know much about it because Alice does all the dirty work, actually, all the good work, you should say. Um, but it's a pretty efficient and modern way of sharing uh, data in a distributed fashion. Um, yeah, so you may want to check this project. And uh, I, will, I will get back to this when I talk about BGP stream. So another area, injection. You may be able to do active measurements on the control plane. So there are ways to inject actually router routes to real routers on the internet. Uh, well, one is if you are, allow are allowed, you are the operator and you just want to communicate, communicate some BGP messages to your routers and then you can use ExaBGP, which is or, it's a sort of Swiss Army knife tool uh, for injecting BGP data in a network. And it's heavily used uh, by some operators actually to deal with denial of service attacks, uh, force black holing, filtering of uh, flows towards certain destinations that are floated by those attacks. Um, so here is a pointer to it, and uh, a tool that is also pretty new, and it's pretty cool for researchers, is the, the peering testbed. So the peering testbed basically allows a researcher to emulate an autonomous system on the real internet. Um, it's a project carried out, carried out by academics, mainly University of Southern California is leading the project. They basically have their own autonomous system, uh, a bunch of prefixes that they own, and they peer in multiple points in the world at various large IXPs and at some universities. With, they peer with a lot of other autonomous systems, right? They peer at IXPs, so lots of ASs, so they have quite a few points of presence. And they have a system, again, based on Quagga, that basically acts as a sort of a net for BGP messages, so that allows uh, researchers to run multiple experiments in parallel without disturbing each other by using just one autonomous system. So your experiment will use a, a private autonomous system number, the same way there are reserved private IP addresses. And then this autonomous system number will be stripped uh, by this sort of multiplexer. And uh, it will be used to um, basically create sort of uh, virtual direct connections with, you, with your peers. And so you will basically peer on the internet not just exchanging BGP messages, you will receive traffic. And then the traffic can be tunneled to you so that you can do a lot of stuff. So basically, you are doing actual, uh, active measurements on the actual internet, which I find pretty cool. This is also a, a quite present uh, work infrastructure that is being developed. Uh, as you see, the, the paper was that the infrastructure was, the idea was first presented in Hotnets in 2014. It has been used for uh, some pretty cool papers, and uh, they have the same mechanism that I have described for uh, um, Periscope, the looking glass thing. Like, you have to apply for an account as a researcher, exp uh, explain the experiment that you want to run. You get also a little bit of uh, mentoring, right, about how to do it properly, using properly this setup to run your experiments. And there are pretty good things that you can do with it. Um, I think I said all about this one. Yes. Um, we are almost at the end of the toolbox. So another thing that I wanted to point out, and you will use these tools also in the exercises later, it's that there are, and these are easy to use, really. these are just web interfaces towards databases, and they are ridiculously powerful. Uh, one of them is provided by Harrigan Electric, the BGP toolkit from HE. And the other one is RipeStat that I mean, probably will talk a little bit during the, your, your lecture tomorrow. No, but I can. No, but you can. Yeah. Um, yeah, you should, I think. But you, you will also be around during our exercises. So, yeah. yeah. So we can play with these tools. You can use them even to just look for a string of a certain organization and find their AS number. And then you can find which prefixes they announce. And then uh, RipeStat will tell you actually over time using the rib dump, so with a granularity of hours, when these prefixes have been announced by which ASs. Right? So you start getting a, you can use these tools, for example, to start to get a big picture about the phenomenon. Right? I see certain prefixes from an AS. Does it normally announce those prefixes? What does it do historically? Did things change in the past? Or when you read, I don't know if you read news about BGP hijacking events that have had traffic. Uh, from financial institutions in the US, go to Russia and back, and blah, blah. 
and there are IP addresses on the nano mailing list or in the reports from Dying Research. I don't know if you're familiar with this thing. You can go in Ripestat and try to see actually what they talk about. Um, okay, did I miss, this is again a question for you, did I miss anything? I'm sure I missed a lot of stuff. <sighs> Nothing? People that do measure BGP measurements, I covered everything. Relationship data sets. Peering the B. Peering the B? Okay. So we should, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. You want to say something about it? I mean, I'm not, okay, I didn't so study. So, so Peering the B is a database where network operators put their AS, their autonomous system numbers in, and uh, what exchanges they're connected to, uh, what private facilities they're connected to, uh, where you can find more information, where the looking glass is, that type of thing. Great, thank you. And you were mentioning the uh, AS relationship data set. The AS relationship data set from Kada. From Kada. Yeah, I didn't talk about customer cons and the AS. I mean, I talked about the AS relationships, right? And Kada does a lot of effort in trying to infer these relationships and then curate, curate some data sets and make them available to people. And there is also a web interface to dig into this data. So you can just search for AS rank, Kada, uh, AS relationships. I will add the slide with these things that we have mentioned here. I know also that there is another, I mentioned peering, I know there is another project from you guys. Yeah. Yeah, so you should have raised your hand, I got you. That is very similar to peering, right? Yeah, it's, it's uh, well, it's simpler than this. So it offers a web interface where you specify what you catch, what you want, which handicap sites or which sites you want to activate, and then you SSH into the nodes and run your experiment there. So it's not with a multiplexer. It's not with the multiplex, but it still it will allow you to inject traffic on the real yeah, internet. Yeah, and you also receive traffic. And um, we are in, we're not in high speeds, but we are like online locations. So that not only universities, but also commercial suppliers. Yeah, again, I insist, this is pretty cool. I mean, when I did my PhD, saying active measurements meant by default data play. Right now, because of these guys, it's not true anymore. You can do active measurements on the control plane. Yeah, so, so don't draw your own because it's. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of work. It's painful. Yeah, it's very painful. Even to keep it running, it's very painful. We want to use it. I don't want to do any more infrastructure. I mean, <laughs> BGP's dream has been enough for me. So let's talk about that one. I have 30 minutes, maybe 25. But thank you for the feedback. I will add some stuff there. Um, it would be cool, actually, to keep compiling, at least. We'll think about it. Maybe we should have a wiki. Or whatever you young guys use today. <laughs> Uh, okay, so now I'm, uh, I don't know what's the English expression for it, but like trying to basically do marketing for BGP stream. So I showed you a lot of tools. And in my opinion, well, that, that's really what we faced when we had to do some serious uh, BGP, uh, create some serious infrastructure for uh, continuous uh, BGP monitoring. That there is not much for processing and analysis. So here you will not find uh, many things, especially when we start with BGP stream. Uh, typically, what do you do for data processing and analysis? Uh, most of the folks will will use, well, now uh, hopefully they use BGP stream, but they use uh, libgp dump, which is a quite simple library. And typically, they use the, the <coughs> command line tool version that dumps some data in uh, ASCII format. And then you, you, you process the output with a bunch of Perl and Python scripts. And uh, you do this, you repeat this process for each single uh, dump from Routius and Rypris, it's really not, uh, I mean, we need something better, right? What I was stressing here that I hope that uh, BGP stream delivers is we want to make that analysis easier, faster, able to go up with big data and with real time data. As I said, this monitoring infrastructure uh, provided by Routius, Rypris is mo moving towards real time streaming. You want to take advantage of this. And this is important. I mean, this is an important part of the chain. You can have lots of data, but then you have to look into it. Uh, so that's, uh, that's why we, we developed BGP Stream. Uh, so what is it? It's an open source software framework for historical and live BGP data analysis. So we designed it to, to be able to deal with large amounts of distributed data. So the data from the collectors is distributed, right? But we want also to be able to deal with it. In heterogeneous sources. So 
have a BGP stream application or script that you write in Python, for example, being able to process at the same time data from route views and from write, write views. Um, as I said, we want to support, we support near real time data processing. We target a broad range of applications and users. So it's mainly for researchers, but it actually can be used by operators to do monitoring of the infrastructure. Uh, scalable is extensible. Basically, we try to design a simple API. And then this actually happened just randomly, I, I have to confess. I mean, we sold it in the paper, but uh, uh, we, we then later realized, oh, nice, what we did actually facilitates reproducibility and readability, which in science is not bad. Right, and now we will see practically um, how BGP Stream achieves that. And if you want to know more, and also because my presentation needs to be compacted now in 30 minutes left, uh, you can read our IMC paper from last year, where there are lots of details. There is also a website where you find plenty of documentation, tutorials, uh, examples of code in Python, in C, all the APIs that we support. And of course, you can download the code. And uh, the current version is 1.1. We got contributions from already quite some people. Here are some folks that I have to apologize with because they sent us a pull request for a BGP sec supporting BGP strip. And we still have to merge it. But we promise that we um, are going to incorporate it in a new release of BGP Stream, which is version 2 that is coming soon, really means hopefully this summer, um, which will have also support for uh, native support for BMP, which we are doing actually in collaboration with the same guys from Cisco that are developing uh, OpenBMP. Um, another thing that I want to stress about BGP Stream, well, besides the fact that people are using it, and I'm so happy when I see papers published or submitted at conferences, that are using BGP Stream. We're getting, we're starting to get feedback from different research groups, also about what they want in the new release. But they are actually using it. We are using it for our research you know, all the time. Uh, but other point that I wanted to stress is that really this happened also thanks to coordination with the other folks uh, that I mentioned earlier. So uh, we even organized together a BGP hackathon that happened in Keda last year. We hope to organize another hackathon early next year hopefully have some of you guys. We were offering lots of travel grants, so people from Europe shouldn't be scared to come to San Diego. Um, and it was, uh, I think it was uh, quite a success. We had also a lot of fun. Um, and then BGP Stream has been used also in other hackathons, so we are seeing that uh, it's, uh, people are liking it. And then I had to borrow a slide because I didn't have time to clean up my slides for this talk. I mean, I prefer to give you information about all those tools rather than uh, cleaning up this slide. This is borrowed from our IMC paper presentation. This is how Alistair summarized how painful it, it was uh, to do um, you know, analysis, that analysis uh, before BGP stream. So typically you have to get from an archive like Kraut use a certain dump in MRT format, then you would run then you would run BGP dump over that file and parse the output and cry while you repeat this process every time. And then when somebody picks up your research after a while, it's all a mess. And they don't know where the files are, they don't know which script you use, in which order, and it's hard to reproduce and blah, blah. And I'm going to save you this thing more later. <coughs> the, instead, the BGP stream uh, uh, operating model is, is different. It's based on a metadata broker. Uh, right now, there is one instance that is uh, deployed in KDA, but we're working with Drive to deploy one in write and with route views to deploy another one, so we can have mirrors. Uh, but really, uh, this broker is only dealing with metadata. So what it does, it, it constantly crawls the public repositories of data, and it updates metadata about what is available from which collector, and which projects, and which timestamp, right, and so on. Right. And then you write your own BGP stream application, like a, a Python script, or you could run a command line tool from the BGP stream suite. And uh, what a BGP Stream application automatically does, you just tell basically the application, I want to see all the data from all the collectors of route, route views. I don't care about this. And, uh, and I want this data for this time frame, or I want this data from now on, and just stream it. And uh, basically, you will issue a request to the broker. The broker will tell you where the data is. And then the application will, auto will automatically download this data and process it on the fly while it's getting the data. Okay, this is the very high level model. Is it clear? Does it make sense to you? People not, but I know that people who know also know already about it. 
I hope so. Um, we can also talk offline about this thing. So I'm trying to go fast to incorporate as much information as I can. Please stop me in time. This is another way of seeing the story. And it's maybe more clear because it's a kind of an architectural view to BGP string. We have colored in blue the components of the infrastructure that we have developed, right? And uh, in the bigger picture, there are in orange the, the, the other pieces that are not developed by us, they are not provided by us. So at the, at the bottom layer, you find the actual data from the data providers, routers, right? This and so on. Right? Then you have the broker. Uh, besides the broker, you can also uh, use local data. So you, we have other categories of metadata providers. But think of this as the broker that I just showed you in the previous slide, right? And then at the, in the core, in the middle layer of the architecture, there is this library, libbgpstream, which is developed in C, is lightweight, efficient, et cetera, et cetera, which really takes care of dealing with the broker, interrogating the broker, parsing the, the request, and then getting the data from the, uh, from the provider. So you don't have to download any data. The application does it for you. And it downloads the data directly from the providers. It just gets the metadata from the broker. Okay. So you get simple access to lots of data, it acquires the data, and then it makes simple to process the, the, this data. So it exposes to the upper layers a C API, and then there are Python bindings to this C API, so you can write your scripts in, uh, in Python, that is then used by the, 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 the upper layers. And I will talk a little bit more about, about these ones and uh, how you can use them for your research. And in the paper, there are also examples of how you can use them. Just to give you an idea, then these concepts, you will see them in the, in the lab session as well, but you will not see them in C, you will see them in Python because we decided to be kind you know, to you. Um, but the concept is, is the same for, uh, for the API. As I said, the, 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 the Python API is just Python bindings to C. But anyway, you instantiate a stream, and then you can set a set of filters and say that you want the data from the RRC00 collector of RIPE, you can say from all the collectors of RIPE and from this collector of route views, and then you decide if you want data from the rip dumps or from the updates. And you can say, I just want to see updates. I don't care about the rest. And you specify the time interval. This is our Unix, uh, what do you call it, uh, epoch uh, timestamps. So the API is pretty simple. Um, this is one of the two main data structures that you use, and you will see them in the exercises. Um, and hopefully, you will not at us. So the first one is the BGP stream uh, Rayborn, uh, which it's an extension. I say encapsulates, but it's basically an, ex an extension of the MRT record. Remember, MRT is the data format that is traditionally used by route views and write priests in their archives. I don't know if I said it, but it's uh, specified by an RFC. It's becoming older, but that's the standard. And even if things change, probably for a lot of your studies, you want to look at historical data as well. So you will have to deal with it unless we take care of translating everything into BMP form, which is an idea. Um, right, so this is how the data gets to us. And it actually inheri it in inherits some properties from how BGP messages are, are sent. So the dumps are composed of multiple MRT records. And uh, an update message is stored in a single MRT record, but because of how BGP work, you may find multiple update messages related to the same prefix in the same MRT record. And uh, there is a reference to this in the next slide. So since basically the MRT record is not really the most atomic type of information that you can imagine, because you can find updates related to multiple prefixes, and maybe in your analysis, in your data analysis, you care about just one prefix. You don't care about the others. So then we provide a, a more atomic, more atomic is horrible, but uh, data structure, which we call BGP stream LM or BGP LM, which is sketched here. Uh, and so an MRT record groups elements of the same type, but related to different vantage points or prefixes. For example, related to different vantage points, it happens with the rip dumps. If you remember, the rip dump that the collector produces every two or four hours is just a collection of all the reconstructed adjacent ribs out of all the peers of the collector. Right, the, when the collector dumps data, it dumps everything at once. And it will have, since these data structures are in memory in a completely different way from how we describe them, it will dump data for one prefix but related to multiple vantage points. And you may get only about one vantage point. So you want to access 
data specifically about a certain prefix, a certain vantage point. This is what the BGPLM does. It gives you the most atomic access to the data. And uh, as I said, you may have also uh, prefixes uh, sharing a common path, and instead you want information only related to a certain prefix, and that's what you get in the, in the BGPLM. Questions? You guys are tired. Hope you're saving some energy for the lab. Um, continuing with the C API, the mechanism is very simple. Anybody had experience with lip up? TCP dump. Ah, I see more people working with traffic. Yeah. That's why I, I spend most of my time too during my PhD. So we we basically try to reproduce the same model. There is a while loop that just pops records. Right. The difference is that we have two typically we have at least in C. In Python you may not see that much. But we have two while loops nested. One is to get the BGP records and then we break Right, we open, we unpack the BGP record into BGP elements. And then you would want to just do some processing in the BGP elements. So the idea is that basically with BGP stream, we uh, offload you from thinking about a lot of aspects that are related to do your experiment and your analysis, and you can focus just on this part. Right? You specify which data you want to read. Then you don't have to rewrite all the code and the scripts to hack the data together, filter stuff. Just focus on what you want to do here. This appears more evident with the Python uh, API that is more friendly. Anyway, so that's the C API, right? And uh, as I said, there are a set of APIs and tools. And the basic one is an imitation of BGP dump, but in a BGP stream version. So it's a common line tool that will dump in ASCII output the information about the paths. And here you will see that they are reported in the format that I was saying. Um, but since it's a BGP stream application, it allows you, you don't give it a file name, right? You just say that you want data from this collector. This is a, a route this collector. There is a San Francisco Internet Exchange point. Uh, and the timestamps of the time period that you want to analyze. You don't care. You don't care how many files overlap with the time period, where they are, what's their name. Just say, I want to look at this data from this time. And then it starts dumping this data. And that will show you, you can even omit this, right? And it will start dump data, streaming live data, basically. So in the paper and on the website, you find the code, uh, an example code that we used to demonstrate that in Python, you can easily uh, run experiments about analysis of BGP data. Here we, we looked at the topic of uh, uh, path, uh, AES path inflation, the fact that because of policies, certain uh, paths from sources to destination, anyway, certain paths take a longer route than the shortest path, and that has been demonstrated that, I didn't do research in this field, but I read about it. It has been demonstrated that it has an impact on convergence, which had, it's one of the problems of BGP, right? So it's stuff that you, some people study. So we picked it as an example of a scientific data analysis. And we showed that really you don't really need to write m much to take all the data from the route collectors from a certain point in time. We picked a day of August of last year, I think. And uh, crunch it, reconstruct uh, a topology, and compare the actual paths that you observe in BGP from this collector, collectors, from the different vantage points to the origin uh, AS and compare the, the actual paths that you observe to BGP with the shortest path that you see in the topology that you have built thanks to the paths that you saw in BGP. Does it make sense? So then in the diagram, we were trying to sketch that it is more than uh, what? More than 30% uh, of paths that actually uh, exhibit inflation, right? So, and this was done with a few lines of code. So, the reason why it's not just to brag about it or to marketing, the reason why we put listings of code and tutorials on the website is so that you can even just take the code, change little pieces and learn from there. Um, this is, a, I think, a, a also a quite a, um, it's a nice example to illustrate some things that you can do now with BGP Stream since it's targeting a, uh, near real time and with BMP support it will be full real time streaming of data is the ability to do control plane and data plane measurements at the same time live. 
So in this example, we were looking at the communities. Remember earlier I told you BGP communities are a special type of attributes that are used to uh, propagate a different type of information to your neighbors, but also to ASs that are far from you. And some of them are used, some of these communities are used to um, specify uh, filtering for uh, what we call black hole, what is called black holing, right? For, uh, uh, as, a, as a mitigation towards the analog service attacks. And uh, so what we did in this experiments, ju experiment, just to demonstrate the capability, uh, basically we were uh, monitoring um, uh, BGP communities, where we're looking for uh, sp specific BGP communities that we know that are indicating black hole activities. And then when we were seeing them, we were triggering measurements with RIPE Atlas, that's going to be shown tomorrow, um, from multiple vantage points towards the prefixes that were black hole. And we were trying to establish uh, basically, which ASs were um, deploying, let's say, this protection mechanism towards the victim of the denial service attack. And then, once we saw the BGP community that was indicating instead the, the, the end of the black holing process, we sent again trace routes and we tried to examine the difference. Um, so you find also these, uh, these experiments in the paper. Questions? Uh, Alistair says I, I shouldn't talk about this, um, but I can't resist because this thing is our baby, guys. <laughs> so, I don't know. Anyway, this is a this is a tool. It's written in C. It's modular. It's based on plugins. It mainly f it mainly focuses on generating uh, uh, statistics at regular time intervals. So let's say you want to do live monitoring or you want to crunch a bunch of historical data and you want you know, data binned with certain time bins. And then what you, what you do, you just forget about all the, uh, the details. You just run your plugin that does a specific operation for every time bin. Right? And so in this example that, again, I don't have much time to talk about it, we, we demonstrated that with a simple plugin that we distribute as an example, you can easily uh, see, observe, or even use it to detect some very simple types of BGP hijacking activity. And this is a, an actual uh, BGP hijacking of the Italian uh, research network, GAR, that happened in, uh, oh, in 2015, that was documented by DIE in research. And so we picked it for that reason. We knew already there was an event there. And we, use, we show how with BGP Corsario you can find these events pretty easily. It's uh, just a demo. Um, OK, a couple of concepts that I think I touched briefly, I mentioned while I was showing you things. Um, uh, OK, it's clear that you don't need to manually download data, right? Another thing that I wanted to emphasize is that for all of the tools and APIs at the upper layers, the interface is more or less the same. Right? You typically specify uh, the time range, the type of data that you want, which sources you want. And, this come, and here comes what I was saying, that we randomly uh, got this feature. Right? This feature basically allows to reproduce your experiments pretty easily. If you have your 30 lines of Python code, they are already incorporating a definition of the experiment that you are running. You, don't, you can just pass those 30 lines of code to someone else. When they run their code, that code, they will basically repeat your experiment. Right? OK. And then you can do the same thing live. So instead of specifying uh, the, the end of the time interval, you omit, or it depends on the API, you indicate minus one, or you omit the time information, and then you start getting data streamed in line, which means repeating your experiment, not reproducing it, of course. Then also, um, remember at the beginning I said it's quite a versatile uh, software framework. It, there may be multiple types of uses. You may want to do those kind of uh, live experiments like this one, or you may want to look at a specific problem, or you may want to look at, you may like crunching lots of data. Big data now, it's a, it's a big thing, right? We have more capabilities than before. And um, here, basically, here in the paper, we demonstrated that with the Python bindings, leveraging the Python bindings, uh, we call PyBGP stream, you can easily write scripts that use Apache Spark, which uh, I think most of you are familiar with it, right? But it's similar to Hadoop, let's say. Uh, to run some uh, big data <laughs> experiments so that we could put the buzzword there too. And for example, here we crunched a bunch of data from rib dumps from 15 years, 
to look at historical data. This is um, uh, one of the examples that we have. And all the, the scripts that we wrote to do this analysis are on the website. So you can use them as an example to write your code with PyBGP stream under Spark. Spark. Uh, what we did here was looking at the size of the routing table. You will do something similar in the, in the exercises. A little, a little but yeah. Um, and it's showing exactly what we were telling you about the full fit peers and the partial fit peers. Right? This, is a, this is a heat map about the size of the routing table over time of all the peers, sorry, of route peers and right peers. You see that most of them are concentrated here. This line shows you the growth of the BGP routing table over time, which by the way is another interesting topic because it caused a lot of routers on the internet to crash when it reached 5, 12K. Um, but what you see also is this noise here. What, what are these? Partial feed peers, right? This is important. If you want to calculate the, how the size of the routing table has evolved over time, do you want to average everything or you want to cut this stuff? Right. You probably want to cut whatever is not a full feed peer. Um, and then this was important for our exercise, for our uh, examples, because we crunch a lot of other historical data. And sometimes we wanted to normalize the data to the size of the routing table at the historical point in time. And so you really want to know what's the average size of the routing table at that time. So you don't want to make the mistake if you're normalizing the data with that information of including the partial fit peaks. Did I convince you enough that you need to care about that? And uh, so, sorry? I mentioned also the multiple origin AS conflicts earlier. Remember when I was saying that things are complicated also in the BGP world? Um, so those are cases in which a prefix is announced, originated actually by multiple ASs. Right? So you will find multiple announcements in the internet for the same prefix originated by different AS numbers. Briefly, what we show here we here we show the number of MOAs that we detected for each single collector of route views and write views over time. And then this thick line is showing the aggregated information. And if you notice, this thick line at the beginning, it matches this one when there, was, there were less collectors. But then it diverges and it goes up. It means that the sum, I mean, sorry, that the MOASs that you detect by looking at the aggregation of all the data from all the route views and write views collectors is bigger than the number of MOSs <coughs> that you may find even with the largest collector. Because you detect more doubles, let's say, more conflicts if you have more data. So this slide is basically telling you that it matters, depending on which study you're doing, but it may matter a lot to get data from multiple collectors, multiple projects, and get as much data as you can, right? Wow, OK. Um, here we did another thing. Again, another Python script for Spark. Uh, we looked at the number of transit ASs. Remember I gave the definition of transit. It's the AS that allows to carry traffic for, uh, for another AS. And uh, the red ones is IPv4, and then the blue is IPv6. And as you see, uh, the number of transit ASs for IPv4 over time have been pretty constant. Right? So probably infrastructure evolved in a um, I don't find the right objective in a certain way. Yeah. Anyway, uh, in a more uniform way, let's say. And instead, for, for blue, you see what happens to IPv6. So the percentage, the fraction of transit ASs for IPv6 is reduced over time. Even if the, the IPv6 started growing here in terms of AS numbers. Uh, sorry, guys, I'm rushing through this, so I don't know if it's clear. But this is an example of another statistic that you can compute to investigate over time the evolution of the infrastructure. Um, then I talked about BGP communities. We have an example about BGP communities. Something that I didn't mention about the communities is that, especially the black holing ones, uh, often are supposed to be stripped by the routers uh, once they are processed. So a lot of BGP communities, theoretically, you're not supposed to see them. Luckily for us that we do measurements, a lot of ASs don't strip them. And so we studied this phenomenon, and we tried to figure out which collector among route and write is luckier in terms of uh, acquiring um, communities 
because as I said, communities are a precious uh, measurement data source. So it's quite interesting to know from which uh, route collectors you have more chances to, to see them, to observe them. Um, and this is it about this. And then I don't think I have, yeah, I don't have much to talk about this. But um, originally when I had this slide deck, I mean part of the slide deck, I was starting talking about BGP stream, talking about um, why did we end up doing this. And the reason for me, I was doing traffic analysis, I was doing other stuff. And then I started working with Emil, actually, um, on uh, outages that happened in Egypt and Libya during the Arab Spring, when the governments shut down the internet because of civil war. Well, at the time it was just protests. Uh, protests. Um, and then we, we got interested in the topic of, uh, of outages, and we realized that crunching BGP data and analyzing it was really a pain. Um, required lots of time, and there was nothing that would help us to, to uh, do it in an easier way. And then I decided, and uh, I don't know if lucky or not, I got funding basically to produce, uh, to, to uh, prototype an infrastructure that monitors the internet 24 7 to detect large internet outages, like big blackouts of entire ASs of countries, which, uh, believe it or not, I will show you one, uh, happen often. I think I should just switch to the demo because otherwise if I keep talking about the slides, we don't have time. But this project that I'm talking about, outages, is called IOTA, uh, Internet Outage Detection Analysis. We started five, started it five years ago. And um, it's, as I said, it's about monitoring the internet 24-7 to detect uh, large internet outages that affect countries, autonomous systems, and regions within countries. It requires to crunch lots of data. Hey. Hi, John. Um, over time, and part of this data is BGP data. And uh, when we had to build this infrastructure, uh, we couldn't find anything that would help us. So basically, we had to develop BGP stream. And then we realized, OK, this feels like a gap in, uh, in literature. And uh, well, not in literature, in the state of the art. And so we tried to create a more versatile project, open source, that you guys can use and hopefully you can contribute to. Um, yeah, I want to give time to Alistair and Emil to make an announcement, so I'm taking just one last minute. But this is one of the outputs that you can get from IOTA. This is an interactive interface. It will tell you outages that have been detected in the last week, in the last 24 hours. You click on a specific country, and now I hear I cherry-picked uh, Iraq in, uh, what was this, October? Yeah, September, sorry, 2016. All these uh, bars that you see are all drops in the connectivity of Iraq. When there were some ministerial preparatory exams <coughs> and the government decided to shut down the internet to not allow people to copy during the exams. There are actually political reasons for this. I've been explaining this later because you think, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you think it's kind of ridiculous, but the government shuts down the entire internet in the country for that reason. But this uh, is related to how the government is perceived, how a regime is perceived by its citizens. Right? If it doesn't have control or not on that new topic for the exams for hiring people who work in the, in the infrastructure of the regime. So, um, uh, yeah, anyway, the drops that you see here are basically this graph, as I said, I don't have time, but it's the result of data that has been processed and distilled live continuously using BGP stream. Um, I actually have, yeah, normally I use like this slide to describe the entire IO infrastructure. And then BGP stream is this piece here that we use to crunch this data. And then normally I would tell you how we use all this stack. And I will explain it in detail. You find it in the IMC paper, if you're interested about it, uh, to develop our infrastructure. There is a message um, about this useful for you. If you want to build some more complex infrastructure, this gives you a hint of what are the problems that you will encounter as a researcher and also as an engineer, actually, to engineer this infrastructure. So here there are some examples of all the little pieces of, of the, the system that have been put together. And then we have built something on top of BGP Stream to create a more complex system that basically reconstructs the routing table of every vantage point every minute. Um, and I think I'm done with this. Um, if you are curious about the stuff that I talked, uh, that I talked about, just come and talk to me in, uh, offline later during uh, the breaks. Um, thank you.
Alistair, you wanted to say something about the your yeah. session, which so is after. I guess uh, there was an email sent out asking people to install BGP stream and make sure you had it running. Has anybody had problems with that or cannot have get it running? Nope. Great. So for the Has lab, anybody tried? Yeah, there you go. That's a very oh, okay. Okay. So for the lab session, we're going to assume that it's working and just get right into actually using it. So if you haven't managed to get it working, um, I'm going to be hanging around for this next break. So come and talk to me. Uh, I 